Today I'm joined by Josh and Ryan, and we will be reviewing the recently released final volume of the Lightbringer Pentology entitled The Burning White by Brent Weeks. Say hello, guys. Hello, friends. How's it going? Before we get started, let's get a, a shout out from our sponsor. A word from our sponsor, Bookshelf, our parent company. Have you ever wanted to listen to an audiobook, but but been out of Audible credits and been frustrated by the whole time on Overdrive? Audiobooks are fantastic, but can still be difficult to access. Bookshelf is an innovative new platform that solves this problem by opening up its large audiobook library to free. Slight couch, you have to listen to ads every now and then, but that's a paltry price to pay for the content available at your fingertips with Bookshelf. Spotify for audiobooks. Bookshelf is coming soon to all platforms. Let us know if you are interested in beta access. Okay, thank you, Bookshelf. Um, now, before we get started, a brief overview of the Lightbringer series. So Lightbringer takes place in a world where some can use different colors of light to use magic in different ways. The narrative follows several different characters slowly mounting with a heretical group that is slowly seizing more and more power from the established kingdom. That's kind of the outline of the series. Um, we have a lot more to say about that, uh, and we're going to do a few different segments here. So before we get into it, so this is the fifth and final book in the five book series, obviously. Um, we're going to start with a series review. So no spoilers in this part at all, guys. Zero spoilers for the entire. So someone who's not read any of the books is going to be comfortable listening to this segment. Um, and let's just start with kind of some overall thoughts, pros and cons of the series. What do you guys like? What do you, what do you not like? Well... I really liked uh, the world that Brent Weeks created, the Lightbringer world, especially the magic system. I think that it's very unique. The, in case you didn't know, the characters uh, draw they they gain magical they gain magical ability through the color of light. Different characters will absorb different shades of light, and some characters can absorb multiple. And through that, they can kind of channel that light into a physical form which they can then use in various yeah so it's kind of it's this hard magic sanderson-esque system that weeks uses in a really cool way uh to give different characters abilities and then um uses those abilities strategically in many different conflicts um lots of cool action and, and fighting um yeah so so magic system definitely one of the biggest pros of the lightbringer series so i, I think the biggest standout from the series is brent weeks's character work he did an amazing job um, establishing characters that you care about, but that are not perfect, that are not uh, flawless, and that are very relatable. The villains that he presents are some of the most nuanced villains um, in the genre, and he does an exceptional job establishing his characters. Yes, so characters is, is definitely another high point that I have noted here. Um, one thing about the characters, and I want to get your guys' thoughts on this, um, how did you how did you like the way they were, they were written? It's a little interesting because the writing style uh, he just writes a lot of their thoughts, but they're not italicized or anything. So you kind of have to read it and understand like, okay, this is the character's thoughts, and then sometimes they'll be like, you know, just a, a third person narrative, and then you have to separate those things. Do you ever get a little confused? Is that ever kind of jarring for you, or did you just catch on to it? So I, I'll freely admit I listened uh, to the series on audiobooks and the narrator did, a, did an amazing job. And uh, so that wasn't too much of an issue for me because those thoughts were still in the character's voice. And so I was able to, to track it. Yeah, as someone who read and listened, I definitely agree with that. Um, one, of the advantage, one of the advantages of listening is for sure the character voices. Um, there's been times where I've listened to a book and that's almost a bit of a giveaway. Like if there's something that the author is writing and they don't necessarily want the reader to understand who's speaking at the time, like it's some kind of secret conversation, but then the reader will actually just read it in the voice of the character. Um, I can't really remember the exact instance of this, but um, that is one downfall that I just kind of thought of a little funny thing that might happen. Yeah, I also listened to the book, so I didn't really encounter um, any of the any of those issues you were talking about, Stephen, but I, I also thought that the narrator did a great job switching between voices so you knew which character was talking. And I also thought he did a good job um, communicating thoughts as well so that I, I understood pretty clearly when the character was thinking to themselves and when they were speaking to other characters. Shout out to Simon Vance. I, be I believe Simon Vance is the name of the 
reader, but I did not make a note of that. So that could be way wrong, but uh, hopefully we have you there, Simon. Um, okay. Any other thoughts on the overall series from you guys? I think that this series is going to go down as doing an exceptional job. Like we talked about establishing characters, establishing a new and innovative hard magic system, and also um, kind of pulling away from some of the tropes in the genre, but still having things done in a really unique way and satisfying way. And also sometimes surprising ways. So I don't want to, you know, that's vague because I don't want to get into spoilers, but he takes a lot of um, liberties, especially towards the end of the series to, and kind of goes a different way than you think he's going to for a lot of things. Yeah. We can talk about that more in the spoiler section later on. Um, Oh, one other thing I wanted to note was just the writing style in general. One thing I did not like about the series was how far into thesaurus at times weeks pulled from. So sometimes he pulls these words out that I'm not even sure if they're real words, don't know what they mean if they are real words. I mean, you can kind of get them from context, but it's like, what is the point? Can we make this a little bit simpler? Did that ever bug you guys? So I think that the the learning curve in the first book, um, really, it was, it was tough. Um, seems like he threw a lot at you with how the magic was used, um, a lot of different terms, a lot of different, you know, structure to this whole religion. Um, so I think that that was, that learning curve was hard. Um, Daniel Green has a YouTube video that explains it. That doesn't have any spoilers, but that can be a good thing to reference as you're going through the start of this, get your bearing. I noticed that a few times, Stephen, in which uh, there were some words I didn't know, but I didn't really detract from my experience of the book at all. But yeah, I think sometimes it will kind of catch you off guard where you'll come across a word that may seem out of place. You know, it takes you a little bit out of that out of the experience of reading the book. So from that, we have learned that I am so arrogant that if I hear a word that I don't know, I immediately do not like this thing. So so I, I, I do want to, and we'll get into this a little bit more with the content warning, but I did think that there was a pretty substantial kind of tone shift between the first book and the rest of the series. The first book kind of felt like it was almost a young adult book. Um, in some of the ways, like it avoided any um, any hard swear words and um, it didn't have too much content in it. It was still an intriguing book and I don't want to take it uh, anything away from it. It kind of seemed like a young adult book, but the other books uh, do away with that and lean a lot more into to content. Yeah, and this is probably a good time to transition into that. So the last piece of our no spoiler review, um, all of our podcasts are going to contain a content warning why? Because it is really hard to find a content warning or rating for a book. So if I'm looking for a book and I want to know what to expect from it, there are no MPAA or regulatory ratings on books, right? And so you have to kind of crawl through Goodreads reviews and the internet to find any kind of uh, idea of what you might expect. So our content warning for Lightbringer, Josh kind of brought it up. The first book, The Black Prism, is like, I don't know, a PG book. There are hardly any swearing. There's, there's no sexual content, but yeah, there must be some kind of, there must've been some kind of switch with the publisher or something because books two through, I mean, the rest of them have more hard swearing, uh, more sexual content. Um, I never thought the sexual content was anything too graphic or, or violent or anything, you know, nothing, uh, really distasteful, but you do have to prepare yourself for that. Um, what did you guys think? Yeah. At times I, I found that I don't know, the descriptions of the women were sometimes, you know, very curvaceous. It seemed like uh, maybe not the most realistic descriptions that I, I enjoy in fantasy, you know. It takes a little bit away from me. I feel like they're not describing some of the other features that I think can help characterize a character a bit more, you know, like the shape of their nose or their jawline, or any scars or tattoos, you know, things that can really help them stick in your mind. Yeah, so I agree with that. A lot of you know, there's some debate online about this and you do follow for the most of the first book, a young kind of adolescent teenage boy. And so it's kind of, some of those are coming from him. And let's face it, a lot of times young adolescent boys, that is what they notice. Um, but it can, it can take away from it as well. If, if that's not what you, what do you really like? Yeah, I think, I mean, I noticed the women thing, but also I think the men were sexualized as well, um, especially towards the beginning. But Yes. So that's, that's the content warning. I don't know if we have any more to say on that piece. And let's go ahead and go into the preview 
our next section, was, which is going to be a preview for the Burning White. The Burning White is the fifth book that just came out that we all just read. So this section, we're going to do a preview as if we had not yet read The Burning White. So no spoilers from book five, spoilers from books one through four are fine. Um, this section, we're just gonna go quickly through, um, kind of, let's kind of get readers up to speed. Uh, let's talk about what is left to resolve and what did you, what do you want to have happen in book five? So we can just kind of do some quick hitters through some of these points. Um, I'll give a couple of mine and then we can go round table. So in the first four books, they kind of build up this idea of the light bringer as this legendary figure that's gonna come and save everyone. Um, they hint at Kip being the light bringer so strongly throughout the whole, that one of the things that I wanted to have happen in the fifth book was to have Kip not, being, not be the light bringer because it is like so obvious through four books that he will be the light bringer to the point where people are just saying that he is the light bringer. And if in book five, if he is in fact the light bringer, I'm going to be very disappointed because one of the hallmarks of the first four books was misdirection in a lot of ways, lots of surprises. And so if this is just straightforward, I'm gonna be really disappointed. Well, I, I, I talked about the beginning about how I really enjoyed the characterization. And so what I'm most looking for for book five was a continuation of those characters with satisfying uh, ends to their arcs that really, uh, so you can see a growth from book one to book five. And I think book one to four, you saw that growth but sometimes authors will undo some of that growth at the last book or it won't be end as satisfying. So that's what I'm really looking for. One of the things that I was uh, looking forward to was kind of the resolution to this love triangle. I mean, at the end of book four, it does kind of seem that it's, it's pretty well resolved with uh, Kip and Tysus and Tia. I mean, Tysus and Kip end up getting married, but if you'll remember the last time that Kip and Tia saw each other, they almost kissed, I think. I could be they wrong did. about it. They, they, they did. did kiss. They did in fact, kiss. Their lips touched. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't. I didn't know what was going to happen next. I mean, when if they're reunited, would Kip still have feelings for Tia? How is that going to be resolved? Yeah, that's a good one, and we'll talk about that in our in our burning white spoilers section. Um, a couple more for me, and then you guys chime in if you have any more. So one thing I really did not want to have happen was I didn't want Cruxer to die. And for some reason, this was just on my mind reading it. It seems like he's going to be someone that they're going to kill off. So I made a note of this before the series started. Don't kill this guy. I really like him. Uh, Weeks doesn't kill a lot of his characters. But for some reason, this is just on my mind. I don't want him to die. Um, another couple things. So I want to resolve this whole Gavin Dazen thing. Like at the end of book four, there was all of these things with Dazen's memories and the black... Luxon and everything, and I'm not really sure what is what, uh, what's reality, what, what's been uh, erased by the Black Luxon. So I need to have that resolved. And then along that vein, I need to have more about the White Luxon. The White Luxon we saw in book one, and it's been kind of like tossed around from, I believe the White had it and Iron Fist has it at this point, but what is it? How did Gavin draft it in book one? Uh, what is the point there? Um, it's kind of this legendary thing. Um, so I need to hear more about this in the fifth book. Um, do you guys have any more? Yeah, I, I've been really fascinated with the sub story of the immortals and of these beings with immense power. And so I'm looking for a little bit more lore attached to them, a little bit more insight into who they are, where they come from, how they can affect our world, how much they can affect, not our world, but the, the world that Lightbringer takes place in. Yeah, and kind of the, the the creature that Gavin thinks is a reflection of himself down in the in the prisons below. He, um, which ends up, you find out at the end of the fourth book that it actually is a creature that seems to be trying to escape this prison. I don't know if it's related to the immortals, but that's something that I wanted to find out. Right, right, and that's related to the whole Black Luxon memory thing. Um, kind of along the vein that I was talking about, like what is really going on here? Um, the Immortals, I want to talk more about, and we can talk more about this in the um, in the review of the book itself. But honestly, to this point, I do not like this part of the plot. Um, they didn't really come in until I think like midway through the third book of this series. And we're supposed to believe that all of a sudden they're this huge part of the conflict, but we have no idea what they are. Um, they've just kind of been, we've got glimpses of them. 
but we're supposed to believe that they're, they are these really powerful beings that we should be really concerned about, yet here they are like totally on the fringes of the story. What's going on here? I, I'm not liking them to this point. Um, also, so, okay, so then one other thing that I have noted down here was I want the blinding knife to do something cool. Um, the blinding knife, we're not sure what the purpose of it yet. We know it's involved with the prism creation process in some way, which is another thing we need explained. But um, it, the knife has morphed into several different forms, starting from a small dagger up to what they call a gun sword. Um, and it's taken powers away from Gavin and given powers to Andros. Um, and that was in the second book, I believe. But other than that, like it's just kind of been passed around. Um, there was a time where I had to kind of track like who has it, uh, what's it doing. And it seems like it's being hinted at, at some great purpose. We don't know what this is. So this is another thing I want. Um, okay, so those are all the things that I have. If you guys have anything else, feel free to jump in now. Otherwise, we'll jump into the actual review of The Burning White. The other things that I, I was thinking about um, anticipating before I read book five uh, was the cliffhanger of Iron Fist, where he declares himself king of Korea. And he, we know that he is, in fact, a member of the order. So we're not exactly sure where he stands and how he's going to factor into this coming book. That's a big cliffhanger. And then the last thing is what's going to happen with uh, Gavin, he's been tasked by Grinwoody to take the blinding knife and stab it into Orholum, or the the center of all magic. Right. Yeah. So two of our characters' fates hang in the balance here, um, and and there were really kind of several characters where we're not sure where they're going to end up. Okay. So thanks for your guys' thoughts on the series. We're now going to go into the burning white review section. So spoiler rating, flashing red lights. Do not read or listen, hopefully listen, do not listen if you have not yet read the book. Um, also, before we go into this, just a note, there are a lot of details in the series. We probably got some things wrong in our conversation here. I don't think any of us have read the series twice. And honestly, I read the first four books earlier this year and then hadn't read any more until, or you know, hadn't revisited until The Burning White came out. So it's been some time. I've probably forgot some details. So if there were mistakes, just go ahead and kindly tweet us, but do not destroy us in your reviews because we made a mistake. Um, that said, let's go into The Burning White, book five. So we're going to start with a character recap. Um, I have 13 main characters jotted down. We're going to go through what happened with the characters and our thoughts on that. Did we like it? Did we not? Um, so we'll start there and then go into more detail. So character number one, the prism, Gavin slash Dazen Guile. So Gavin, as Ryan noted, or this is one thing that I had trouble with the series. What do I call this guy? Is he Gavin or Dazen? I guess he's Dazen. So we'll say Dazen um, goes with Gunner to the Nexus of Magic at White Mist Reef. Um, he is tasked with destroying Orhalem. At the beginning, we do not know what exactly Orhalem is. We know it's the god, but we don't know um, how corporeal he is. So Gavin goes through this journey with his slave friend, who is confusingly named Orhalem. It's this very cerebral experience um, as Gavin and Orhalem go through this journey, um, very symbolic, and he makes it up to the top of the tower. He encounters Orhalem, who turns out to be a god and immortal from the other realm um, and has some really nice conversation with him about just kind of you know what it is to be a human um what did you guys think about gavin's journey here i really liked his character progression he started out as a prideful powerful man who believed in nothing but his own power he's the head of a religion but didn't believe in god um Later in the series, he changes into kind of a crippled, powerless, bitter man who just kind of wants to destroy this nexus of magic or God or Holum, who he sort of blames for these things. And um, ultimately, he changes into a man with his faith restored and a reason to live. Um, and it's interesting that you talk about being confused about what do we call him, Gavin, Dazen. I remember thinking that in the earlier books. Um, 
why do we keep calling him Gavin when we know he's days in? And then I thought, well, maybe this is kind of a way that Weeks just is trying to avoid confusing readers. But, you know, at the end of this book, I think we learned that he's been seeing himself as Gavin for so long. He kind of believes he's Gavin to some level when ultimately what the world needs and what he needs is to be Dazen. And that's kind of how he needs to change his own perspective. He needs to start being Dazen again. The only questionable thing that happened to Gavin is that all of his powers were restored in the end, which I think um, it was sort of a lack of consequences for any of his actions. But that was kind of the the one li- little negative thing I had for his character. I hated that he got just healed at the end, like his finger came back, his eye came back. Absolutely hated that. I thought a a redeemed, um, you know, a a mentally and emotionally redeemed, but still physically crippled character is much more interesting and satisfying than this person who is then healed. Um, the message I got was, well, he couldn't really be, you know, who he was trying to be until he was physically healed as well. That's not how life works. And I, I think Weeks totally missed with that one. I, I totally agree. I mean, you need consequences. You need, you can't just make every, wave a magic wand and make everything work. Even if you're God, you know, you should still say, hey, like these bad things happen to you. They, they can become a part of you and you can use them to, you know, make yourself better or learn from them or however, whatever you need to do. But just to have it go away is, is not very good character work in my opinion or just plotting or anything really it was just kind of lazy i think to be honest yeah i think we all agree with that and i I think most readers will agree with that um okay next character is karis karis the white karis white oak um karis is the is currently the white which is basically the leader of the chromeria the governmental uh body over the kingdom and I mean, things happen to Karis in this book, but there's not a whole lot of development, in my opinion. What did you guys think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, it didn't seem like much changed for Karis. She kind of stayed the white. Maybe she learned to, that she needed to rely on other people a little bit more. Um, She couldn't do everything on her own. Um, But, I mean, I felt like she was a little bit of a, not great, not bad character in this book. I wasn't ever too interested to read her viewpoints. Um. Yeah, I agree. I think that Weeks, again, kind of missed the mark on really being able to provide some valuable insight into how the how this religion, the Chromerium, was like, what type of internal changes they were going through and how like another de facto major player in that religion could be leading and steering it and you kind of got a little bit that she wanted to bring major change and reform but it wasn't very engaging you know it was just kind of okay this is happening i'll make a big speech that's it yeah she definitely did some things but as far as character development i feel like that mostly happened in the previous books um karis is a solid character but not someone who really stood out for me in this book Next up, let's talk about Tia. Tia is probably a a fan favorite for many. What did you guys think about Tia in this book? Um, To be honest, I thought that her her delving into ethical dilemmas, I think, you know, where she's, she's trying to figure out, well, I've done a lot of bad to accomplish good. How much, how much of, how much bad is too bad and I I felt for her at at points you know she had a lot of moments of loneliness and separation from all of her friends the mighty have kind of have kind of gone to do great things and she's stuck in the shadows possibly betraying some of her old beliefs she doesn't know what's going to happen in the future when she's reunited with her friends and I think she has some interesting character development and but once again we see Brent's 
Brent Weeks, his unwillingness to have any real consequences where Tia is poisoned and she overcomes her poisoning but is physically damaged with her eyes being stuck and only being able to see peril. But her friends develop some magic lenses that kind of alleviate most of those consequences. And so it once again kind of just a another undoing of any real consequences. Yeah, they invent the transitional glasses for Tia to save the day at the end of the book. Um I thought, you know, I disagree a little bit because there were actually some consequences for her. Like she missed out on the love triangle that you referenced before and she feels some separation from her friends. So not necessarily a happy ending for Tia. I mean, it was a ending. I, I, out of everyone's ending, I thought Tia's was done decently. I think that one of the most satisfying moments of the entire series was when she took down Murder Sharp. When she took her, you know, put that cyanide or whatever in her tooth and because she knew that he would eventually take it from her. That was, I know that was foreshadowed. I've seen like people on Reddit saying, you know, oh, this was when you could have seen that coming or whatever. But I thought that was very satisfying. I thought it was clever that she didn't just try and overpower him with peril or whatever, but that she just outsmarted him. And that was very satisfying. Okay, interesting, because when I first read that, I was like, wait, he took the tooth and the tooth had cyanide in it and that's how she's going to win? Like, really? She anticipated it that much? But I did not know that it was foreshadowed on Reddit, so. Well, yeah, people people point out when she got hit one time in the, it was just like she took a punch in her jaw or something and she thought, oh, is this how I'm going to go out? And it was kind of like, you wouldn't just think that if you had, you know, she's taken a lot of hits and she's never thought, oh, I'm going to die. But it's foreshadowing that she has cyanide in her tooth. So if that gets, you know, dislodged, that it'll, it'll kill her. So there's been a few, there's a few things like that, that we're kind of foreshadowing it. One unsatisfying part that you just reminded me of Tia's storyline was actually when she, when she poisoned the order, it was, it was a little convenient, you know, where she just kind of poisons the whole order in one go and, pretty much everybody's dead except for the one person that she needed to kill you know it was like let's kill 99 percent of the order except for grim woody who now is just miraculously didn't drink the wine that he always drinks like yeah. you said it's, it's kind of like well they solved one problem but still left conveniently another problem for a more dramatic conclusion it was just yeah yeah what did you guys think about the order in entirety like I was never that impressed with the order. They were kind of always this lurking threat that was presented and they have this backstory as being part of this previous civilization that was wiped out by the the Lucidonius and everything. So back in lore and they've, they've got this significance to the story and they're supposed to be this threat, but really were they ever that threatening? I I was never really that satisfied with the order. 100% agree on that it could have been like this amazing thing where you saw that they had been pulling all these strings and causing all these issues to come forth. You know, there could have been a lot of cooler ways that they tied the order in for all their supposed strength, but really it was just, we're told that they're bad and scary. So we think that they're bad and scary. And then like, like Ryan was saying, I think they were defeated a little easy and, um, it's just kind of all worked out so conveniently and then Grinwood, he was not killed. And then, you know, he went on and, and the very ending, I, the ending with Grinwood and Tia, I thought was kind of fun where, you know, she just finally outsmarts him and takes him down. But that whole thing was, I don't know, it felt a little too perfect. Um, okay. Moving off Tia, let's talk about our main man, Kip, Kip the lip, the turtle bear, the light bringer, or was he? What did you guys think about Kip? Well, um, Kip, I definitely was not a big fan of Kip. I've got to say. He fell into a lot of character tropes. I thought, you know, he comes from kind of a no-name village, not really relevant politically. He has 
a wise mentor who turns out to be very important, a.k.a. General Corbin Danavis. He's also low-key royalty related to the Giles, and he turns out to be a very powerful magic wielder. You know, I think that kind of checks a lot of tropes, you know, going from zero to hero pretty quickly. The other thing I didn't like about Kip was that he started the books kind of being a whiny kid. You know, he had a lot of growing up to do, which I understand. But then by the end, Burning White, he was almost a little bit too perfect. He was making the right decisions, saying the right things to offer consolation to his friends. He was just a flawless military leader. He knew how to make all the perfect decisions. He was just willing to sacrifice himself. It was just kind of, he was a paragon of virtue almost. It was he was annoyingly too good by the end. In my opinion, it was it was hard to relate to him. Ryan believes that Kip was very punchable. <laughs> you would have liked to punch Kip in the face, I think. Okay, yeah. So I I disagree and kind of agree. I feel like the one thing that Brent Weeks did to kind of set Kip apart was making him chubby. You know, that was kind of what he relied on for the first however many books until he just becomes you know, chiseled, but, and I think that that was kind of lazy sometimes, but at the same time, you know, when you're an adolescent and you are struggling with your weight, then that is sometimes all you can think about. So I think that that was kind of good in the first book, but it dragged on a little bit throughout the series. One thing we were kind of talking about as we were kind of reading the beginning of the book together, I had an issue, like you were saying, Ryan, where he was suddenly like kind of a king figure and knew how to rule and knew how to make alliances and knew how to take out, you know, gang leaders. And he kind of did all this when it was second nature, when nothing else in the series came second nature to him. He had to struggle to become a good fighter. He had to struggle to become a good magic user. And then now he's a ruler and he's, he's just perfect. I think that was kind of, again, kind of lazy. Yeah, he never really shows any leadership qualities until he has to be a leader and then all of a sudden he's giving these rousing speeches to huge crowds and and leading everyone and it's like wait is this the same guy i don't get it and, and so this is kind of moving off kip to a little bit more of the pacing of the book but it's i think it's a good time to talk about it is nothing i feel like in that first kind of third of the book or quarter of the book nothing really mattered you know when he was kind of gathering all these alliances and he was kind of figuring out what all these mirrors were used for but it didn't feel like there was any real payoff to most of that stuff. It just felt like it was kind of happening, but for no real reason. Yeah. It was like at the end of the fourth book, Weeks has them all off in blood forest, but he's like, Oh crap, I need to get them over to the Cremaria Cause that's where I'm going to actually make the action happen. So he has this kind of long drawn out thing to get them over there and he tries to tie it in, but yeah, it really was not too tightly done. Little, little. Yeah, he was. I feel like he was trying to make the whole campaign to take the blood forest matter, but really the only thing it served was developing Kip and the Mighty, which was cool, but it didn't serve a whole lot of plot purposes. It just served character. What did you guys think about the ending? So towards the ending, Zyman ties up Kip on Arhalem's glare, which is the point of execution in the Chrome area, and they kill him, but he doesn't die. Of course. I mean, did any of us think he was actually going to? No, he doesn't die. He gets brought back by an immortal, apparently, is what we're supposed to. And then he's just fine afterwards. He loses his colors, but at the end, he's starting to get them back. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't really like the ending for Kip. I wish, honestly, I wish he would have died. I mean, he did a lot of things in the battle. He would have been a great sacrifice. Could have been a good point for the suit, for the characters and the religion to move on from there you know he could have been the light bringer in this figure but instead he just comes back to life what do you guys think yeah i i have said this before and i'll say it again it's um kind of like a, a lack of consequences for another character he he makes these sacrifices and then gets everything back he ends the day with he comes back to life he get we're hinted that he's getting his powers back he has a good relationship with all his friends. The only one 
we lose is Cruxer, which is sad, but it, it wasn't, it, for me personally, it wasn't too tragic. Maybe you would disagree with that, Steve. But I, I think that it's kind of a fairy tale ending for Kip. Yeah, I think that the same set of people that believe that Kip was actually dead is the same set of people that believe that Harry was somehow dead. Spoiler warning for Harry Potter, I guess. But um, is the same people that believe that Harry was dead when he was at the train station or whatever. But again, it didn't, it didn't seem like there was any point in doing it. Besides maybe developing out the mortals, which he then didn't do, it was, it was, it was strange. And yeah, I feel like it was kind of unearned and then uh, just severe lack of consequence. We could probably talk about Kip more, but I think we've covered the main points and we're just going to circle around that more and more. Um, moving off Kip, let's talk about Iron Fist. Iron Fist is a very cool character, one of my favorite characters. Um, at the end of the fourth book, we didn't really know what was going on with him. Turns out that he is actually good. You know, he's not really this double agent part of the order. Uh, he's still, his motivations are solid. Um, unfortunately, there's this tragic thing where he kills Cruxer. Um, I, yeah, really sad about that. Cruxer was my man. Cruxer gets taken out because he makes some bad emotional decisions. Um, Iron Fist really doesn't do anything else for the rest of the story. He's just kind of injured, but yeah, I don't know. I guess Weeks just kind of wants him out of the story and let the he wants to let the other characters take center stage. Um, I don't really know if there's any hot takes about Iron Fist. I was pretty surprised when it turns out that he was a member of the Order reporting to Grin Woody. And then I was once again surprised when he had declared himself King of Korea. I was expecting a lot of twists with with Iron Fist and kind of the twist is that he was good all along and he was really just trying to save the day. I, I really liked the weakness it showed in Iron Fist because it felt like he was a perfect character for most of the series. But then when he actually tried to do something conniving, something that uh, that was outside of his comfort zone by like setting the, up this sacrifice and then was going to, you know, turn the tables and have a beaker and Woody, like that would have been really cool had it worked. And it showed his weakness as a character for it not working, like in a good way. It showed that he's not perfect and that he can fail. And he failed in a pretty spectacular way with that. I like that. So there's Iron Fist. Next up, Liv, Olivia Danavis, Feralex, the immortal king of, or queen of Super Violet, right? Um, what is the point exactly of Liv? Like, why is she a character? Why are we getting her viewpoints? What does she bring to the table? I don't know the answer to any of these questions. I wish she was not in the book. That's my take on Liv. Yeah, hot take, but accurate. It's like she was brought into the book early on or into the series early on um, as kind of this like hot girl character that Kip likes. And we never really got much of her character other than that she is smart and kind of nice. And then she goes off and does her own thing because she's also independent. But then it's like, what, why is she still here? She, I don't know, we should have killed her or something. There's, there's really no point. And then she just goes and heals her father, taking away any consequence from that happening. And I guess there's some unanswered question, like, what is she doing now? They talked about her going beyond the Everdark Gates. Um, another thing that was not answered in the series, what the Everdark Gates, the kingdom beyond there, uh, never really got a satisfactory answer or point to what that was. It was kind of like, you know, in the Wheel of Time when they're, is the kingdom of Shara across the way. Okay, wait, let's not do Wheel of Time spoilers. Okay, no spoilers, but it's similar to the Wheel of Time. Okay, all right. Uh, agreed, yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of, I agree with uh, there not being much point to live. She helps out the bad guys, then she helps out the good guys, then she just kind of throws up her hands and is like, fine, I'm just going to do my own thing. And maybe it's kind of an insight that Wicks gives us into the, the transformation of a drafter to kind of fusing with an immortal to become one more powerful being. That could, that could be it. And he, he's certainly setting up future events, whether in, in another series, that's probably another point. Yeah, I think a lot of these things could be really cool, but they're not as it stands right now. And so that's what we're judging it on. Yeah, somehow in a 990 plus page book, all of these things were, th these immortals and a few other plot points were explored and but just not adequately really locked down. So 
I think that's one of our main disappointments. Um, we probably are being a little too harsh. I mean, this was an awesome book, right? We, we agree with that. Yeah, so that's something I want to talk about later is this book is a lot more than the sum of its parts. And so that's one thing I'm going to talk about when, you know, get assigned this final rating. <laughs> okay, so next character or group of characters, the Mighty, which consists of Cruxer, who sadly dies. Um, I guess Tia, what else? We have Big Leo, Furkuti, Winston. Um, was there another one? Ben Haydad. Tysus joins the Mighty later. Yeah, I guess Tysus is kind of in the Mighty. Um, and, then, and then you have all of the raw recruits to the Mighty throughout this book. Right. Like, yeah, he brings in one more for no apparent reason who gets a name but never does anything. I, I thought a good plot point would have been somebody in the Mighty, like one of the original members of the Mighty betraying them. I think that would have added some, some good tension. Um, but they're just kind of a fun band of heroes. They worshipped Kip by the end of it. Like we've said, he just kind of turns into the perfect leader and they just love him. And Yeah, I think little... we, we, all, we all like the Mighty, right? They have some fun banter back and forth. It's a little cheesy sometimes, but they're a fun group of mostly teenage boys. Um, I think Ryan was calling for a little more misdirection, which I think we've all brought up. Um, some of the foundation of the previous books was a lot of, uh, you don't know exactly what people's motivations are and, what, and who they are even but we didn't see that nearly as much in this book. That's one of my um, main critiques of the book, how straightforward it is and how nicely wrapped up with a bow it is by the end. Um, any other thoughts on the Mighty? Okay, let's go into Tysus. So Tysus Malargos, Tysus Guile, Mary's Kip, um, another beautiful, smart, independent woman. I mean, it's hinted she has some, um, you know, she doesn't do everything perfectly. She has some negative qualities, but um we like tysis i guess what, what do you guys think yeah i really like tysis i think that she i think her character is good i think that she asserted a lot of independence and also kind of was one of the only people that would uh seriously talk back to kip it seemed like a lot of the mighty would like joke with kip or like for a second there would be some tension there but it seemed like tysis was somebody that would actually confront kip tell him when he was being an idiot and kip would listen to him it would help him adjust yeah, she was, I, I liked the fact that Kip didn't end up with the obvious girl. I I was expecting even up and through, even past when Kip and Tysus said their wedding vows, whenever I was still kind of thinking in the back of my mind, well, what's going to happen? How's, is Tysus secretly bad and she's going to betray Kip and then that'll, that'll open the way for Tia. But I was, I was pleasantly surprised that Weeks uh, kind of kept them together even if they did have some cringy romantic moments and but she was you know a beautiful wife an amazing politician a little bit too perfect but i guess she did have some flaws that were hinted at okay sounds like both of you guys enjoyed tysis a little more than i did um no real negatives from me just kind of thought she was maybe a little boring at times didn't do a whole lot in this book for some reason even though she was like the leader of the green drafters she was not good at fighting at all which was kind of weird to me um i thought she could have been another good candidate for someone that could have been killed off and there would have been some ram ramifications there um but she was a she was a solid character uh, okay next character um probably one of the more divisive one of my favorite characters andros guile um gets a lot of backstory in this we see several chapters of flashbacks we get a really good sense of his motivations. Uh, I love Andros, one of the best, probably the single best character in the series. What do you guys think? I think that the that the character work with kind of having Andros be a foil to Kip is amazing. I remember at the towards the beginning of the book, or maybe like a quarter of the way through, there was one chapter with Andros ending it saying that I'm the Lightbringer, and then the next chapter ended with Kip saying I'm the Lightbringer, and I thought that that was amazing. I thought that their parallel arcs were amazing. I thought that um, that their interactions and their relationship was really what made this book special for me. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot can be said about Andros. He's probably one of the most interesting characters in the books, if not the most interesting character. Um, Burning White reveals more about him than I think it reveals about anybody else. Um, you learn a lot about his motivations and his relationships with his family. 
I remember thinking in the earlier books, how could Felia Guile ever love this guy? I mean, is, was their relationship just totally political? But we kind of see a little bit more behind the curtain with that. Um, but he's almost, he's very competent, but he's also flawed in very satisfying ways, I think. He does whatever he can to fulfill the prophecy of him being the light bringer and saving the world. He, in the meantime, he is unfaithful to his wife, which is still bad, even though he has her consent. He sacrifices his most innocent child, Sebastian. He, I think, plays a key role in turning Gavin into a monster. And this is all because he's convinced himself that he's the light bringer. I loved, um, I think some of my favorite moments in the books were when Kip and Andros would play Nine Kings and just the, the conversations they would have. Um, and in the end of the book, Andros is um, kind of literally on top of the world, but he's, he's very alone. And you can see that, I think, when he sort of yells at Grin Woody, I thought you were my friend. Uh, that's kind of out of character for Andros to say and to show that kind of emotion. And um, Kip saw that Andros had nothing left except to become the light bringer. So he, I think that's part of the reason why Kip gave that to him. Yeah, so much to be said for Andros. I think Andros is to Lightbringer what Tyrion Lannister is to A Song of Ice and Fire, like the most memorable character. So many aspects to him. Um, gets a very satisfying ending. I thought, Ryan, I agree with that. Uh, you know, he gets what he was really going out for uh, from the very beginning, and we see that in this book. But at the same time, it didn't turn out to really be enough for him. Did he find happiness? Probably not. Okay, so moving off Andros, let's go straight to the person closest to Andros, Grin Woody, the old man of the desert, the leader of the Broken Eye. Um, there were some interesting moments for me with Grin Woody. Uh, th there were a couple of conversations where Andros and Grin Woody were in the same room. And I was thinking, man, does Andros know that Grin Woody is really the leader of the Broken Eye? I wasn't sure. At, at one point, I was convinced that Andros did. He, in fact, did not and was surprised by it and rewarded Grin Woody with his freedom, basically, for tricking him. I thought that was kind of a funny moment but uh grin Woody, you know as leader of the broken eye we don't get to see him doing a whole lot as the actual leader we see him more in the capacity what do you guys think of the character i think he had the he had the opportunity to become another outstanding character almost andrus like but because we got no scenes of him actually leading anybody or actually doing really anything that actually mattered when it came to leading the bro the order of the broken eye he just kind of fell flat and was an interesting concept character, but didn't do a whole lot of interesting things. Yeah, um, I thought that he was interesting because I personally didn't suspect him at all as being um, bad other than the fact that he kind of did nefarious things for Andros. So I was pleasantly surprised when it turned out he was the old man of the desert and that he was Iron Fist uncle. I think those were both some great twists to the story. I did think it was a little bit out of character for Andros to just let Grin Woody leave after he found out that Grin Woody's betrayal, even if it was he was played and he won, Grin Woody won. I think, you know, this is Andros Guile, a man who literally killed his son to further his own plans. I think he'd kill a slave with it, that had crossed him. Yeah, that was a little interesting. I think we saw that Andros is willing to honor you know honor when he's bested like when kip beats him at nine uh towards the end and then they have this agreement andros honors that in the same way he's kind of honoring grinwoody besting him at a game that has taken place over the ages but yeah it does seem like maybe he should have just killed him because ultimately andros is really trying to get ahead and he has lied cheated killed whatever in the past but here he is more honorable yeah a little questionable i agree ryan Okay, so three characters left. Uh, we have Gunner, Zyman, and Murder Sharp. Just real quick, between these three, which one of these three did you guys enjoy the most in this book? Not necessarily which one did you like the most, but which character work did you think was most interesting? I liked Gunner the most. I thought he was funny and unpredictable. I, I agree with that. I really liked Sharp in relationship to Tia. I think that it showed a descent into madness for him that I really liked. And while I was always nervous and didn't 
particularly enjoy reading his parts. I thought that that was a really cool uh, kind of rivalry that him and uh, Dia had. Yeah, so I liked all three of these characters. Since you guys talked about the other two, I'll just say briefly on Zyman. Um, for some reason, I like liked Zyman a little bit. I, I mean, obviously a despicable person. <laughs> Steven but, with the hot takes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> his parts were always kind of enjoyable because I really wanted him to, you know, just, just get what was coming to him. And finally, he does. But, uh, but every time Zyman was in the picture, you knew something was going to happen, right? Like this guy was such a loose cannon and so adept at doing bad, evil things. Something fun was going to happen. And, and Zyman always provided that. Ultimately, he, uh, he got what was his from a, a set, of, set of pistols from Quentin. But, um, and, and that was one of the parts where I was, I was cheering. That was an exciting part when Zyman was finally dealt with. Um, Okay, so moving off characters, we talked about a lot of scenes in the character parts, but there are a few specific scenes that I wanted to talk about, and maybe you guys have some remaining still after the character conversation. So one of my favorite scenes was, I believe, I think I even remember the chapter number. There's like 130 chapters in this book, but I believe this was chapter 50. It was a conversation between Tia and Quentin, um, just about the nature of God and why bad things happen to good people. Um, I thought this was really profound. Um, maybe even got a little emotional during this part reading it. Um, do you guys remember this conversation? Yeah, I do. I, I remember specifically a line where Quentin tells Tia that he could answer her, but it's not the right time. And even if he said the same thing to her right then versus later, it would mean a whole lot differently, different to her. Yeah, so stuff like this is the reason why I really like reading fantasy. Some people don't understand fantasy and they think it's all just pleasure reading, but there are so many nuggets of real impactful things in fantasy books and they totally reflect real life and conversations like these where you can see the characters have been built up over literally thousands of pages. You know them inside and out. You see them doing things. It parallels your real life and then you see you know, advice given or converse or back and forth that just is so raw and emotional. Um, and it's beautiful, really. Yeah, I love, I really love that we didn't talk about Quentin really as a character, but I love the unshakable, unshakable faith that Quentin has while still being grounded in reality. He's not someone that's going to go out there and defend everything that the Cremarium does. He's not somebody that's going to go out there and pretend like he knows everything, but he has an unshakable faith that he, that as long as he does what's right, he can be a force for good in the world. Yeah, Quentin, a great character, did not make the list of characters we recapped, but um, I think we all love Quentin. He was able to kill my man Zyman, so, you know, he's and, a funny character. And he had a low-key, very good redemption arc, you know, and the forgiveness that he had to find with himself for, you know, killing an innocent person to where he got to the ending of the book, of the series, I thought was a really cool redemption. So from that moment to another similar one, um, and this was my other favorite moment of the book. Maybe I'm just getting soft in my old age, but um, two of my favorite moments in the book were these uh, more cerebral conversations. So this moment is between Gavin and or Hallam when they're on top of this tower talking about um, really just life and, and Gavin's attempt to redeem himself. Um, Gavin has a very hard, or Dazen at this point, really. Well, transitioning between Gavin and Dazen. So Gavin has a hard time forgiving himself um, and, re and realizing, um, you know, the power of who he is, and or Hallam helps him realize this. This was another moment where um, I got kind of emotional. I, maybe I should go back and read this again, because um, maybe th there might have been some good quotes coming from this part as well. Um, but really strong moment, and he's really talking, I mean, he's talking directly with God, which is a obviously a, a powerful thing that can relate to our lives as well. What do you guys think? I think that this is going to be one of the things that's most de divisive in the fan base. And I think that it did a really good job at providing some concrete answers and either like that or not like it. But I think that, I think that Gavin slash Dazen kind of needed this for his character arc. And it was also kind of, I thought it was earned. I thought that um, his whole kind of journeying up the tower, basically like journeying up Mount Olympus, right? that he earned that conversation and I, I really enjoyed it. So this is one thing Daniel Green talks about in his review, um, that this is more of a Greek story 
And I think we see things like that with, you know, having these conversations with God, journeying up Mount Olympus, there being kind of this redemption at the end for everyone, like in the Odyssey where all these bad things happen to Odysseus, but at the end he comes home and kills all the suitors and gets all this money and, you know, and has everything he wants. Um, so yeah, Weeks is definitely more of a Greek inspirational writer. Spoilers for the Odyssey. I think we can spoil the Odyssey. <laughs> um, okay, so the last thing I have on my list of scenes we have not covered yet is the main climactic scene, the battle at the Chromaria. There are a lot of things happening. Um, what do you guys think about the battle? Was this, how well were you able to follow it? I guess is where, where I want to start. It was a little bit disjointed because you have different members of the mighty going to take on different banes. And, and then you also have Kip taking on some banes and then some people, I think he ends up killing some of the immortals with the, with the mirrors and then they were coming back later. I, I was a bit confused by that. Um, so there were definitely some confusing parts of the battle for me. So I will say I've never been somebody that really sits there and kind of figure out what's going on. I, I kind of enjoy just reading and being in the moment and um, experiencing what's going on on the page I'm on without really thinking about what else is going on. I know that's not how a lot of other people like to read, especially in these high fantasy things. But I will say that I think one of the weaknesses of this book and what made this whole battle kind of weak is, and maybe weak's not the right word, but not as good as it could have been, was that the whole setting wasn't as fully developed as I would have liked it to be. You know, we spent a lot of time on the Jaspers, but I never had a real clear picture besides, oh, it's a city and there's city-like things in the city and there's a, you know, Chromarium. But I, I never really felt like I had lived there. Like I kind of feel like in some other cities and books that and fantasy books that you read yeah i agree i just kind of imagine like an island the well there's two islands and there's a big tall tower and i imagine the whole thing is kind of colorful just because that's how uh the book portrays it and then there's these mirrors over the whole thing kind of like when you go to an outdoor mall and there's a like uh, threshold thing over the whole mall um so yeah i i really agree with that josh i think Weeks does a great job of developing characters, but maybe not setting quite as much, at least the details of the setting. Yeah, so I feel like if I would have been more connected to that setting and to the Jaspers, I would have kind of cared more when like half the city got destroyed. But as it stands, I didn't really. Yeah, for me, the battle was okay. Um, It felt like it was a little episodic. Like every chapter, there was a different level that the characters had to clear. And there were these different banes that were coming on in different times. And different characters were advancing in different ways. So you kind of saw how things were developing. But at the same time, I was never concerned that anything bad was really going to happen. Were you? I don't know if I was concerned, but I was intrigued. I mean, I read that whole last couple hundred pages really quickly and was pretty, pretty into it. So I don't know if I was ever really concerned for characters' lives, but I really was into it. I was really compelled to keep reading. Yeah, that's fair. I guess... um, you know, and and I said this before, we all really liked the book. I think we agree on that. And I think we're being a little harsh with some of this. We're really just nitpicking. But uh, yeah, I I read the last few hundred pages very quickly as well. Very involved in it. Um, Fantastic, fantastic climactic scene with all the characters coming together, doing different things at the same time. Um, Could it have been a little more streamlined? Sure. But what writing couldn't be, right? So um, overall, we liked the battle, right? Like, pretty cool scene really i did like i did like a lot how kip wasn't able to do it all on his own i mean i mentioned earlier about how he was kind of uh almost too perfect in the in in this book but you know reflecting on that part he he falls short a little bit he's not able to do everything um or is that just because zyman takes him out well i think i along that vein ryan like it was supposed it was hinted at kip being the light bringer being the savior and then it turns out, no, it was a, the light bringer, as I understood it, at least was a combination of, you know, Kip and Gavin Dazen and Andros, and they were all kind of working together. And I thought it was kind of a cool familial connection, even though none of these guys have really ever completely loved or trusted each other. They were able to come together to save. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I, I think that it was really cool how the Lightbringer whole concept was handled, that it wasn't really just one person that suddenly donned the mantle of Lightbringer. 
it was here's the series of events that needed to come together and these people that needed to work together and sacrifice and give and take in order to have the happy outcome that we did. One point on on the battle that we haven't really talked about is the White King. He has been sort of the main antagonist for most of the books. And he was taken out sort of matter of factly, I guess, because Gavin flies in and then gets launched, saves the day with um, the blinding knife. And one interesting thing, you know, you talk about the Deus Ex Machina. I read online on, on Reddit, somebody pointed out that, uh, you know, that literally means, I think, God from the machine. Or, and, you know, God was literally flying on the machina. That's what he named the, or Holm was flying on the machina. He named the, the flying contraption the machina. So Weeks was kind of doing, you know, a little nod to the deus. He, he knew what he was doing a little bit, I think. Yeah, and that's why, that's why I referred to earlier about these tropes. Like, that's definitely a trope of fantasy, and it's been done a lot. But it's cool that Weeks took it so literally and put that literal meaning of that trope into his book. I think that was clever. That seems so obvious, yet when I was reading it, I did not even think of it. But that is awesome. Well, I got it from Reddit, so I can't really take any credit for thinking about it on my own either. Yeah, Reddit knows everything. Okay, so that kind of takes me through the scenes I wanted to talk about. We're running way low on time, but a few unanswered questions for me or little unsatisfying nuggets that I just want to touch on. Um, and you guys jump in if, if you think they're interesting. So one was the whole Gaspar Elos thing. This is the white who at the very beginning of the series talks to Kip. It seems like it's some kind of important moment. It's not mentioned for like four more books. And then at the very end of the fifth book, all of a sudden they're like hinting at him. At one point there is a scene where it's a flashback and there is a character who is like the sister or brother of Gaspar Elos. And it's like, wait, was this scene really, was there something here that we missed this whole time? But no, there's nothing. Um, not sure what the point of that whole thing was. Didn't like that. Um, I never really understood the the gin and the prisons. Like I kind of talked about why Dazen was doing that. He was like gathering them and imprisoning them. But it was, it seemed like it was kind of brushed over and this was a really big plot point, but I, I didn't get quite enough explanation there. Um, I didn't like the deus ex machina of the copy seller that came and healed kip and also helped iron fist that just kind of came out of nowhere um, also some of our immortal criticism and then also never resolved was kip's parentage in the previous book andros was revealed to his father that never came up kip's grandpa showed up at one point in this book and said he was going to challenge andros and you know make his life very difficult uh no nothing ever happened there so those are just a few of my nuggets that were a little confusing, didn't really like as much. Again, very minor things, but um, anything there for you guys? Well, to answer your question, I think the the whole prisons thing where, with, the, with the djinn is that Gavin was gathering them there because he couldn't kill them because he didn't have the blinding knife. He needed the blinding knife to kill them. Um, I was expecting something to happen. What I thought would happen was that Zyman, a desperate play for power, is he would go down and make a deal with the djinn in the, the black prison and kind of become some sort of super villain worse than the White King. But that didn't necessarily happen. Yeah, along with that, and we touched on this before, I just wish there was a little more misdirection in the book. Something like that would have been cool. All of the previous books had lots of misdirection and really cool twists. This didn't have it. I, I understand endings are very hard. And it's hard to make a twist and then also have a satisfying ending. Josh, any, anything here for you? Or should we just go ahead and go to our, our final rating? Yeah, just real quick. I think that the biggest disappointment for me was the Immortals in terms of unanswered questions. It feels like there's a whole wealth of things to be explored that they just completely skipped over. And it intrigued me. And then, so. Okay, so final thoughts. We covered everything on my list here. Um, let's give a rating for this book out of 10. Um, and then just like one thing, one takeaway from the book, from the series, um, what is the legacy of the Lightbringer series going to be? How strong was it really? Um, you guys can go ahead and then I'll wrap up. Well, I, I think you've said it best, Stephen, is that we've been a little critical. Um, I know I've been critical of the book 
when we've talked about it, but I genuinely enjoyed reading the Burning Light and the Lightbringer series. It was very entertaining. The beginning of the Burning Light was a little bit slow for me, but overall, I had fun while I read it. Um, and the ending had a little bit of a fairy tale feel, you know, with a lot of those, um, a lot of the negative consequences occurring to the characters were uh, reversed in kind of unexplained ways that that weren't necessarily foreshadowed um but i think that the world building and the the overall story were high high points for me and um there were a lot of great characters like andros and gavin dazen or whatever you want to call him that made um that had a lot of interesting moments in dialogue that that really helped um, carry the story along for me. I'd probably give this a 7.5 out of 10. Only 7.5? Yeah, so I'm actually going to go 7 out of 10 for for Burning Light. I think as a whole series, I think that um, Lightbringer would probably be more around an 8, 8.5. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I thought that the biggest takeaway that I think would come from this series in terms of its influence on the fantasy genre as a whole is its ability to introduce characters and um, have you care about those characters and also have these characters not really know everything about themselves and to explore themes through the characters that really influence the plot and influence your perception of reality. For most of the characters in the book, um, you get some really valuable and intriguing information about them as the series moves. So I think that's going to be its lasting impact. I forgot to do my lasting or my, my takeaway from this, and I'm not necessarily going to say a takeaway for fantasy in general. I think what I kind of got from this is that Brent Weeks is, he's getting, he's, he's improving as an author. I really enjoyed the Night Angel trilogy. Not everybody did, but I really liked it. Um, but I did think that that his writing is getting better in Lightbringer. And so I'm excited to see what he explores in his next books. Okay, you guys have been too critical. Um, I give this book a 9 out of 10. I give the whole series a 9.5 out of 10. This is one of, after all of the critical things I've said, right? Um, no, this is one of my favorite fantasy series I've ever read. This is one of the, probably one of the first um, modern, fantasies with a hard magic system that's actually completed so it's easy to rate it this highly because there's a lot of similar series that i really enjoy right now um but i was happy to have this one finish quickly because i really enjoyed it really liked all of the books love the characters love the action um you know there's so many little loose ends that maybe didn't tie in perfectly for me but after all the criticism can't say enough about the book i'd recommend it to anyone um as far as the the lasting impact um, I think like Sanderson, this series is going to influence a lot of up and coming writers to develop more hard magic systems to explore more into characters. I think there are a lot of um, modern trends in characterization and the way that issues are handled that are very reflective of modern society and the rising generation. And I think Weeks is very in tune with that. And I love seeing that in books. I think it makes fantasy relevant. And I think that is the impact of the series. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Josh. Thanks to listeners who've made it with us this far. And we will catch you next time with another episode of Bookshelf Pod. Um, what will our next series be? I think it might be a Lycanius wrap-up. The final book is coming out in just a couple weeks now. Uh, another series that we're fans of. And we'll, we'll do a similar format where we will go through and talk about the entire series. Um, let us know if there are any more series you'd like us to cover and just any general comments. And go ahead and like and subscribe and do all those cool things. I've always wanted to say that in a podcast setting, and there it is. So now that I've said it, go ahead and do it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steven. Thanks, Steven.